This is the fifth installment of our, our Venture Creation Spotlight series, um, and we're, we're joined by Walter Katonik. Uh, a brief, background, brief bit of background on Walt, he's a uh, venture partner at Third Rock Ventures, as well as a uh, board observer at, at MoMA Therapeutics, a company that he's going to be talking to us about today. And uh, he brings a significant expertise in, in the development and translation of, of novel therapies. Walt was previously uh, Chief Operating Officer at MoMA. He also served as an architect architect of strategy and operations at, at Fulcrum Therapeutics and was a manager at Clarion Healthcare. Walt received a BS in biochem in molecular biology and philosophy from, from Gettysburg College and a PhD in chemical biology from Harvard University. So, uh, Walt, take it away. Awesome. So you want me to talk about creating companies, that's right? Absolutely. Um, and I think the, the prompt I received um, said something about principles of creating companies. So maybe I'll just start with um, first principle, which is I, you know, I don't claim to have any kind of right answer, just sort of share what I believe. And hopefully that shows up in what I'm about to tell you about with MoMA. But I think the, the, first, the first principle is creating companies is hard. You kind of have to, like, if, if, you're, if one has a lot of capital because you work at a venture capital firm, it's actually a lot easier just to give people money, right? So you have to, you sort of have to ask yourself, why do you create, why do you create companies? I think that's a good place to start. Um, you know, in the case of MoMA, we created the company because, and I think this, this is how I, I think about it. We create companies when there's an opportunity to change the world, when there's an opportunity to make a big difference in patients' lives and no one else is doing it. And that's absolutely true here. Um, and I think from there, we have to just try to be responsible, right? It's, it's, it's some, we often go after big audacious goals. So we have to have some layer of responsibility and that'll come through in the way we thought about it with MoMA. Um, and at the end of the day, I think it, it, as much as we, we want to really talk about conviction, there is a, there is a tremendous amount of conviction, but there's not a lot of knowing. And I think that's where you, where we ultimately get to with the story of MoMA is by the end, you know, we were pretty sure we could do it, but we didn't really know. But we really believed that we could do it and we just went for it. And that's why we raised a bunch of money and hired a big team and went for it. So um, I pulled together some slides. Um, these are all slides from 2019 when we were still incubating the company. And it's, it's kind of fun to go back through them the other day because uh, so much of it actually held true. Not all of it, but a lot of it did. Um, but I think that's the right subject matter for this discussion. I'll look at you, Travis. Um, is that is that what you want? Is sort of the the incubation phase, not necessarily where we are today, right? That would be great. Yeah, I think we we've heard um, from a lot of other other partners from other firms, kind of about the, these principles and kind of a general background. But yeah, if you want to get into some of the some of the nitty gritty with with MoMA and some of the early days of, of the incubation phase, and yeah, I think that'd be really fun. And um, I'll look to you know others to interrupt me. I'm very happy to be interrupted. Um, you know, if I just talk for 50 minutes, it's going to probably be boring for everybody. So please interrupt. Sure thing. Actually, I think what has been very successful for us is kind of take questions towards the end. So what I can do is oh, maybe man. towards okay. the 650 mark, I will consolidate all the questions and try to bucket them so that we can you know, knock out as many questions as possible. All right. Well, with that, then this is going to get really boring. I apologize. For that, everyone, but... <laughs> I mean, feel free if you if you like to answer or answer any questions that have come up, I can happy happy to throw them over to you if you want to kind of mix things up. Uh, that, that's better for me, but you know, yeah. you guys are in charge. So, um, all right. The story of MoMA really begins with um, this. The story of MoMA really begins with um, synthetic lethality, right? Many, many of the folks on this call are familiar with the Broad Institute. Many of the folks are probably familiar with something they have called the debt map, the dependency map, right? This idea that we can look across cancer lines and identify which proteins, which genes are absolutely critical for the survival and proliferation of cancer cells. Um, I do a lot of my work in genetics, um, both tumor genetics and Mendelian um, germline genetics. Um, but when you look at that data, one of the targets that the cancer targets that just jumps out, some beautiful literature on this is something called Werner helicase. Um, many of the folks on this call who've probably thought about bio, uh, biotech before are familiar with this as just a beautiful synthetic lethal relationship in MSI positive tumors. Um, and yet there isn't, there hasn't been a lot of progress on that target, right? And that, that's really where the story of MoMA begins. And it's, 
ultimately the realization that if one wants to take on these complicated molecular machines, take on the drug discovery for complicated molecular machines, one has to reimagine the drug discovery toolkit that they're going to bring to bear. Said differently, these the the sort of kinase drug discovery toolbox that worked has worked so well for kinases doesn't doesn't turn out to to be the best way to take on these targets. And it kind of makes sense. And that's what this this page is really showing. I mean, look at the beautiful intricate motion, right? These these machines cycle through incredible, incredible confirmation as they do their work, right? Use ATP to drive the work they're doing. But these are very different than some sort of little hinge coming in and out as a phosphorylation event happens. Um, and I think what that led us to believe as we were incubating and really considering what one would need to do if they wanted to successfully take on, and again, the, 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 the nugget here was Werner Helicase, um, have to embrace this conformational complexity in a way that just, the, as I said, the current drug discovery toolkit uh, doesn't, doesn't really do. So sort of step one is what, what problem are we solving? You know, is, is this something that no one else has really done? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, pharma, there's, there's plenty, of, uh, plenty of examples of drug discovery campaigns that were not able to successfully drug helicases, Warner, Warner helicase being a, a good example. And as we dug into the problem, what we ultimately discovered is that many of the attempts to drug it were using very standard or very uh, canonical toolkits that had been developed for other uh, other drug drug targets or drug target classes. Um, and so we we sort of got really excited about the toolkit that enables us to really examine this conformational complexity that you're seeing on the screen right now. Um, yeah, what what also got really got us really excited and really convinced that there's a there's a big problem here. It's not just a single target. Um, you know, as we started looking at this class of targets, the genetics on ATPases, the genetics on these molecular machines, incredibly rich, suggested that if we really are to be able to make inroads and come up with modulators of these proteins we might one day be able to look at ATPases or molecular machines uh, with the same drug ability, but also the same utility in the clinic as we currently look at kinases. And that's ultimately why we created MoMA. We saw an opportunity to pull together a drug discovery toolkit that doesn't really exist anywhere else. And to really take on this really rich landscape of genetic, genetically uh, implied or you know, genetically related targets. Um, and that, that, you know, to the principles, that's number one, solve a big problem and really try to understand why no one else is doing it. Um, you know, starting companies is hard. We shouldn't do it just because there's something to be done, particularly if other people are already doing it. We, we also looked at this target class. And one of the things that jumps out is that these, this is a pretty diverse class. You know, all the way at the top, I think we've in the, the bluish gray color, we have helicases, but you come all the way down to the bottom and, um, you know, we've super family like whatever that is. We have lipid transporters, right? This is a pretty diverse class. And I think another, another framework we ultimately developed is that we didn't want to necessarily try to tackle all of these targets, all of these subclasses at once. We started talking about them in this concept of horizons. So even though we want to be able to ultimately tackle all ATPases, we believe that if we start with, in this case, helicases, um, it gives us one toe holder or one anchor point, which we can eventually extend. Um, and the idea being that if we understand the conformation and the way helicases work at a biophysical level, if we're able to create small molecule modulators of those helicases, we're going to understand something about how these machines work, which will allow us to extend into other areas. And certainly that's, that's starting to bear out at the company now, two years later. Uh, we, we ultimately then began defining our toolkit. What are these set of assays or set these ways of working that we need to develop internally that, don't, that either don't exist or don't exist in a focused way? This is an example of a helicase working through its uh, work cycle. And one of the things we see across the bottom are many, many different uh, 
confirmation states that exist. And this is, of course, a snapshot. Hopefully, most folks appreciate that these um, any crystal structure is just a snapshot. There's a lot of richness here that we don't ever really see. Um, and most of the effort at the time had really been focused on the ATP binding site, just this one part here in red. But gratifyingly, we realized or we, we were able to identify that um, in some cases, because of technological advancement, in other cases, just tools that exist, that we could bring together a toolkit that allowed us to really interrogate all of these different conformational states. Um, happy to talk about any of these, but some of these have been around for a long time. Many of these have actually only started coming of age in the last few years, which is probably the, the answer to the question of why is this uh, something we can do now, but could not have done, say, you know, five, five years ago, a decade ago. The, the next slide really gets into the other big piece of this, which is we, we ultimately need to be able to define a function, confirmation, and then a pharmacology relationship. And you know, whether we call it CRISPR, but ultimately saturation mutagenesis, being able to look at the conformational impact of any given residue, being able to look at the um, functional impact of any given residue, really tells us something about where on a protein we need to be binding or modulating the function. And all of a sudden we can use genetic tools to understand um, function and confirmation. We can bring in small molecules developed with the tools on the previous page and really understand which genetics are mapping. And we can build these really incredible relationships and basically be able to say for any given helicase, we can do a true tour de force, understand every residue's impact on confirmation and function, understand every binding site that we're able to identify as impact on confirmation and function. And ultimately we convince ourselves that if one wants to truly take on these targets and really build the toolkit for these targets, we need to start at the beginning and do, do exactly what I just said with the idea that we get better over time and eventually have the efficiency that today we have in say kinases. And the dream of this company is to build that efficiency across this entire target class. I see a question. Should I, Joe, should I go ahead and try to answer it? Yeah, please feel free. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it strikes me that much of the, obviously not all, not all fundamental biology has moved away from academia to the private sector. Why do you think this is? I actually disagree with that statement. I think that there's still a tremendous amount of biology done um, in academia and via public public uh, uh, public dollars. Um, ultimately, I think the answer to the question lies in whether one can truly develop an investment thesis, a positive IRR view on whether the research being done is worth putting cap, you know, profit seeking or return seeking dollars to work. Right. And as I think about my colleagues at the Broad Institute, you know, it's a fantastic group of folks. A lot of the work that they're doing is ultimately focused on um, projects that probably don't have in aggregate, right? In aggregate, a positive IRR that would attract venture dollars. Now, some of it does, and that becomes the basis of new companies. Um, some of it does because it attracts SRA dollars. Um, but in aggregate, I would I would suspect that the uh, there's a negative IRR on a lot of that work. And that's great. It still pushes the world forward. And we, we uh, you know, learn something about truth with a capital T and it sets the foundation for a lot of, a lot of what we're talking about here. Um, so back to, back to the, uh, back to the deck, this, this page really exemplifies what I was saying there at the end is that we believe that as we interrogate these, these proteins, these molecular machines, Learnings on target A teach us about target B, target C. And by the time we get out there somewhere in target N and truly unknowable what, what that N is in, in, in reality, uh, we, we truly believe that we'll get much more efficient. The dollars needed to successfully drug our first target are much greater than the dollars in our later targets. Um, and, and fundamentally, I, we, we have to believe that's true for the investment thesis to hold here. And gratifyingly, it does. Another visual that we developed for this here is just that um, in year one, we have to create a lot of compounds and we have to interrogate a lot of different screens. But by year two and year three, we start to know what works. And for any given target, we're making money, we're running fewer assays and we're ultimately um, needing fewer compounds to get good drug-like properties. <clears throat> 
So then once we, once we, and this is, this is very characteristic of how we work within Third Rock. Once we identified, you know, the problem we were going to solve, we sort of came up with a toolkit that we could use, really started to develop uh, principles of where we thought the value was going to come from. Um, you know, we do a lot on value creation, scenario planning. Uh, we do a lot on thinking through operationally how the finance, the financing needs to map to the milestones. Uh, so this next set of slides is meant to really go through, go through a lot of those pieces. Um, it can be dense, so you know, again, please interrupt if any of it is 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 worth interrupting. Um, some of the principles we we ultimately laid down because we thought that they really they really um, set the stage, right? So first and foremost, I think in order for this to be a good investment, you have to believe that this is a rich target class, right? This is not a single target opportunity. I don't think anyone would would uh, believe that investing the kind of dollars that we were going to go invest makes sense if one only has one target to go after. Um, we thought that a focus on DNA damage, we mentioned Warner Helicase DNA damage response or you know, oncology was a great place to start initially. Uh, we thought that an initial focus around helicases gave us an opportunity to um, an opportunity to really narrow in and get those first set of learnings. Um, and we thought that the value proposition here was really, really clear because uh, we were, didn't believe we were carrying a lot of translational risk into the clinic. And so we started mapping out a lot of pictures like this. Um, you know, this is essentially just saying that we can stack together somewhat standard drug discovery timelines, assume some attrition, and then we can, and I'm going to flip a little quick here, you can flip through different scenarios. What if, what if more succeed? What if it takes longer? What if it takes shorter? And ultimately, that process gives us a really nice uh, way to think about different scenarios. You know, in the first 18 months, we might experience more attrition and we might not materialize or might not do a pharma partnership. Uh, we might have more dollars to spend. We might have less dollars to spend. Um, so we work through a number of scenarios. And ultimately, we land at a picture like this one, which is probably the, a, a really critical one to talk through, which is once we, real, once we set out on an operational plan, that's what we're going to do, right? So in 2020, we were going to spend these dollars. We're going to work on these programs. We're going to deploy this toolkit. Very much what I said about the operating plan, right? We knew we were going to have to spend a lot of money up front to build the assays and under, try to identify where we could have those class-wide learnings. But over time, and over some unknowable timeline, but we projected it would be second half of 2021, we would have spent on the ballpark of $30 million, and we would have the opportunity to see how this was going to play out. Were we going to be more fruitful and be on this more of this upside case where we're spending more dollars, but hopefully hitting milestones sooner? Or we got to sort of cover our butts and appreciate that there might be a downside here as well. And so this is the scenario planning we spend a lot of time on internally to really think through. In all these scenarios, do we feel like there's a good outcome? Do we feel like that we should be raising a small amount of money? Do we think we should raise a large amount of money? What milestones are we solving for across what scenarios? Um, and then in, in our case, we ultimately started looking at it as a bit of a diagonal. I think you might be able to hear my son yelling. Uh, we ultimately got to the scenario where we thought we might be able to solve for this diagonal, where if we raised on the order of $85 million, we would be able to make it to major milestones regardless of the timeline it was taking. I promise you that's not anything atypical for this time of day at my house. Um, and so this, this, this slide and the thinking you just laid out really drove the financing and ultimately the culmination of the company. Um, we did ultimately raise, I believe it was an $86 million Series A, um, and we set out on this plan and um, sort of gratifyingly we're in this second half of 2021 and have a lot of data to really understand where we are for the trajectory of the company. And that'll drive a lot of the progression and when we start hitting milestones, but also um, it drives a lot of um, the downstream thinking around next financing and future financing events. That's so I I talked fast and I will sincerely take lots of questions, but that, that's really the, the set of slides I wanted to walk through because it in my mind it does highlight 
uh, the key principles here. Um, you know, we have to really go after a problem that'll be meaningful to solve. We have to really understand why no one else is doing it. And we really have to put in the time around scenario planning and get quantitative about what the opportunity is and where the upside lies, but also what happens in the downside. Um, and that's that's really what the what underlies this story of MoMA. Um, a little bit of ultimately what happened, um, certainly that everybody appreciates that uh, hopefully we're not coming out of a pandemic, but we're still in a, a bit of a pandemic here. Uh, we ultimately financed the company in the beginning of 20, 2020, uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic, which is its own interesting reflection. Um, I think, I think we actually benefited a lot versus other biotech companies because we did not have a lot of established operations that we had to pivot. Uh, we were a nascent company um, just getting up and running. And yes, there was a major impact in a lot of ways. But at the same time, we, did, we, we, were, we had the, uh, the good fortune, I guess, in some ways of being able to build in a different way. We established different norms. We didn't have to reverse any norms. Um, and I think that helped us a lot. It also had you know, its challenges like many of us have lived through. All right, most of your planning center around taking your programs all the way from inception to clinical POC. Why, how much partnering were you counting on in this financial model? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, we ultimately considered different scenarios around uh, pharma partnering. We did not, we did not count on any. Um, I, I think I can walk through that in a couple of ways. Um, one, pharma partnering in a lot of ways has a cost associated with it, but it also has a huge benefit. But one of the realities is it just takes a lot of time. Um, and that time creates a bit of uncertainty or a lack of predictability. Uh, so we, we certainly appreciate that pharma partnering is part of it, and it may ultimately be something that, that MoMA does. Um, but we ultimately decided that the path forward was to, to finance this substantially with equity dollars. Now, there's another important analysis that, that, isn't, that we often do, which is we can ultimately build a financial model, which we know will be wrong. Um, but as long as it has some internal consistency, it can still have some utility. Um, so we can look at a financial model and make some predictions about what we think our pipeline is worth. And then we can look at comparables and say, what would a farmer partnership do in terms of percent of the pipeline value we have to out license in this case for cash that comes in um, versus percent of the company we have to sell through an equity financing, right? And that's an analysis that becomes really important when we think about raising capital via equity markets or raising capital via pharma partnering. Um, ultimately, it's, it's not, I, I don't think anyone should, should um, get to the point where they believe it's truly accurate, but hopefully it's internally consistent because if it's all built on the same assumptions, you can say this percent of the company for equity or this you know, percent of our pipeline value for, for pharma partnering. And all of a sudden it sort of gives you a way of thinking about the comparison without necessarily being accurate. I think we ultimately included that the best path forward for MoMA, time will tell, but the best path forward for MoMA was to substantially do this with equity dollars. We do have questions in the chat, so maybe oh, geez, also, okay. no, no, no worries. I can also read them out for you. So from Lon, Lonnie Bookbinder, we have a question. What is your viewpoint on more senior, senior CEOs involved in startups that are spin outs of an existing company, but wanting to hire and train younger PhDs? I think it's a great idea. Um, I'm often, you know, I, whenever I'm traveling a little bit less now, um, I often get a, some version of the question of why is why is Boston Boston Cambridge become center of the world for biotech, um, and you know there's there's plenty that's been written on this, but the I guess the narrative I really buy into is this idea that you know Genzyme grew up here, Millennium grew up here, Genetics Institute grew up here, and there's a whole generation of, of biotech leaders that grew up in those companies, and in, in this case, you know more junior roles. They were the trainees at the time. Um, and I think that's ultimately what created this, uh, this concentration in greater Boston. And, you know, tied around that now we have, I think, some of the features of a durable advantage when it comes to this generation of companies, but now also the risk capital being co-located. And of course, uh, the academic institutions need their, 
their proper piece of this as well. Uh, I don't know who who Cody is, but he's getting a he or she's getting a nice uh, nice high. Uh, nice shout out. Yes. Um, maybe we can also go on to the next two questions from I believe is it Suman. Suman. Um, so, how do you decide when is the time to invest into R and D under a company at, versus you know keeping the R and D within a university to do risk the project further? And so, this is a, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I hate the word de risk. Um, it, it's such a negative word, right? I mean, ultimately let's focus on what we're trying to do, which is create value and create a medicine. They're, they're sort of like reciprocal concepts, but why, why use the, the negative when you can use the positive? Um, I think, you know, when I think about universities, um, a lot of it comes down to the encumbrance of IP, um, the, the administrative hurdle that often exists to get work done within universities, um, but then also, you know, the CapEx efficiency that often exists when one wants to do some validating work. Um, you know, it is expensive and it is hard to create a company. You know, universities already have great scientists um, and the infrastructure to do the work. Um, so there is a sort of capital efficiency uh, that makes it worth the IP and the administrative considerations mentioned. Awesome. Uh, we do have another question about typical shareholder equity uh, breakdown between investors and um, I guess the founding time, founding team at the time of the company formation. Any comments there on what what uh, these young or these uh, aspiring trainees or entrepreneurs you know should benchmark against? It's a good question. Um, probably the. The thing I would probably point folks to if they really want to understand this in detail um, would be to pull um, pull public filings, pull S1s from companies that are trying to go public. Um, and in those documents, one can often look back and see what the original founders had in the company. Uh, it takes a little bit of math, uh, but if you're on this call and you're at one of these institutions, arithmetic is probably something you know how to do. Um, the, you know, I... You know, the ranges, the ranges are all over the place and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not necessarily going to try to claim I know what the right answer is. Uh, but I think if you, the ranges you'll see are all over the place. Awesome. But it sounds like we can look into the S1 filings, you know, do a little bit of digging and do a little math and we can, we can get the answer right there. Thank it's you a pretty good that. place to start. Yeah. Um, we do have other questions now in the Q&A function. So uh, oh, I can yeah. probably read us. Now, if we got questions coming up in multiple areas, why don't we start with this uh, one from an anonymous attendee. What do you think about PI starting a company? Um, and we have a question about the failure rate with these uh, those companies, but maybe we can change the framework. And it's like, what's the success rate? Right? I, like, <laughs> I like thinking the positive here. Uh, it's a great question. I, I don't know of a, a really rigorous and uh, a study that, that has looked at you know, PI founderness and whether that bears on success rate or not. Um, you know, I know from our work at Third Rock, you know, we work very closely with academic institutions and, and PIs. Um, so, you know, if we look at our data set, I'd have to actually, I don't like operating in absolutes, but I think most of the companies that we've had a hand in founding have had, um, you know, academics as integral parts of the founder team. Awesome. Hey, well, I actually had a question. Um, I think this is something that a lot of people on this call will have a lot of interest in. Um, maybe, and this is maybe not so much MoMA specific, more Third Rock specific. Um, what's kind of TRV's thought and philosophy on hiring uh, recent uh, recent graduates from, from, from grad school, be that medical school or, or, or from their PhD? Because um, there's there's some thinking for, from from other partners at firms that you know. You really need before you want to get into like early company creation in a venture capital setting. You, you really need a lot more uh, operational experience in the field, kind of knowing what it's like being in a company before you're behind the scenes actually creating them. Um, what's kind of what's your take on that, or, or what does TRV kind of think about you know hiring people right out of grad school? Yeah, we do. We we hire at all levels. Um, so, I mean, I think that's the short answer. I think the longer, more nuanced the answer is that you know the roles and what what the expectations are vary based on the experiences someone is coming in with. Um, but yeah, we hire at all levels. So, you know, for us, it's a, probably the number one 
must have requirement is really strong foundation and, and curiosity. So not just backward looking, but forward looking in science and or in medicine. There's a lot of other questions. Yeah. So the, uh, who wrote the initial yeah. business plan? What did it look like? How detailed do you think a good plan needs to be before you get started building? That's a good question. I'm I'm probably I'm someone who believes very firmly that planning is everything, but plans are nothing. Um, the so I think one needs to spend a lot of time on the strategy, many of the different facets of that strategy. Um, the different scenarios as one looks forward. Um, but appreciate that a lot of what we're doing is trying to predict the future. So we really never know, right? And therefore you have to be ready to pivot and adapt as information comes in. Um, you know, uh, within Third Rock, we have pretty good, pretty detailed plans. We build quantitative models, um, more focused on operations than on, you know, projecting the NPV. I don't know that one, anyone can really do that well. Um, but we, we try to get pretty detailed. I think it, it really does set the foundation for our company that is going to then scale and build quickly, right? Ultimately, if one were to say, here's point A and here's point B, there's a linear curve, that's fine. And then there's a super capital efficient curve, which is skinny and then shoots up. Um, that shoot up and creating very low AUC, but creating the same ultimate amplitude um, requires really good planning. And maybe if we can double click on that for many people who are trying to get into the space, right. And one, and also understand, you know, the value of good business planning, but may not necessarily be as familiar or exposed to these topics, you know, how, for people who are new to this, what recommendations or advice do you have for people to say, Hey, like we, these are some principles you should think about as you're trying to bring that curve down so that you can really get that hockey puck or a hockey stick so that you hit the same, you know, end point, right? What are some guiding principles, maybe advice for people to kind of get a sense of experience um, or with just ways of thinking? Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately there, there truly is, and this sort of goes uh, against the earlier question about do we hire at all levels, but there's no better way to understand how a company works than to go work at a company, <laughs> right? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is, they go hand in hand though, right? Um, and it probably ties ultimately to the expectation point I made earlier. Um, I think studying companies is, is a good place to go, you know, public filings, but also watching companies longitudinally. Um, look at a company when it launches, look what they say in their press release. Um, on the surface, there's often not a lot there. It's a lot of platitudes. Uh, but if you watch a company over a few years, I think one can start to extract, um, start to extract a, a bit of how they got there and what was involved. But also that pattern recognition becomes really important as one thinks about them, the scenario planning they need to do on their own, their own business plan or their own thinking on what an investment thesis might look like. Absolutely. Um, we're getting some additional questions, maybe. Um, one question that we could probably bring up, uh, what characteristics do you believe make an idea capable of raising money early on? Which of these aspects do you think MoMA possessed, but also lacked at the time of its conception? Yeah, I mean, I think we had all of them. You know, this still doesn't mean it's going to work out, right? But I'll try to answer the question more specifically. Um, you know, I think there has to be a clear articulation of the value proposition or ultimately what where the value is going to come from, right? In a lot of therapeutics companies, that's kind of easy, right? We're going to make a medicine for this really horrible disease. Um, it still needs to be clear. And I think from there, it needs to be detailed enough to say, and here's the way we measure the efficacy. Here's how we'll know if we succeed. Here are some of the properties, right? So yeah, okay, we get that one. Um, from there, I think there needs to be a really credible team that's going to go take it on. Um, that credibility probably is nuanced and bespoke to the opportunity, but is actually really important. Um, one of the old adages in venture is always bet on the A team with a B plan, not the other way around. Um, from there, I think one needs to actually have a really good look at um, the value creation, right? So was, my first point was the value proposition, but then what are the dollars to get there? And what's the equity plan over time? Will there actually be a good investment? Um, and I think this is one where it has to be a win for everybody, the investors, the founders, the employees along the way. Um, and so a, a good planned 
aims to strike a balance. Does it ever work out perfectly? Of course not. Um, but I think you can actually see the sophistication and the experience of the people who put the plan together when one looks at how they've solved some of those, those challenges. Um, and then I think from there, the one that I often look for is, um, and this, you know, I think Travis, when introduced me, mentioned that you know my, my training is in philosophy. Um, I don't think, I think it's really hard to, to judge a team or a person's judgment um, perspectively. Um, I think it's maybe able to, one can do it via looking at a person's track record, but if we're talking about a younger set of folks who don't have necessarily a track record yet, how do you do it? The best surrogate for me is epistemology. Does somebody actually have a good appreciation of what they know and what they don't know? Because at the end of the day, we hope that people are making data-driven, rational decisions, um, but that requires a really good assessment of the premises that are giving rise to that, um, that, that logic or that uh, decision being made. Um, so I think that's another one. And anytime I, I really work with a team, I really try to understand how well they appreciate what they know and what they don't know. That was actually the, the thing that I wanted to double click on, right? Because you mentioned, you know, bet on a team with a B plan. So you mentioned, I think, an incredible sense of self-awareness, right? And what they know and what they don't know. For other, you know, for the audience who are looking to kind of build their starting team, build their A team, what should they, what else should they be looking for? Yeah, I mean, there's a tremendous body of literature on teams, which probably tells us that there is no one answer, um, right? I think at the end of the day, when I think about a, a biotech team, you know, we are a highly regulated space when we think about the agency, uh, the agencies worldwide. Uh, we're also dealing with some really complicated subject matter. I mean, human biology is really hard. Um, I mean, at least a lot of physics apply, you know, respond, you know, can be modeled with Newtonian mechanics, right? So human biology, right? I go back to this Craig Vendor paper from years ago, right? We, there's about a third of the genes in the human body that we know are absolutely critical for life. And yet we have no clue what their gene function is, right? And yet we're trying to make something as precision as a medicine that goes in with no side effects. So I think we have to be humble in the face of that, right? It's, you know, what we're trying to do is still worth it. And that's why we do it. Um, so ultimately where I land is, you know, we, I think, I think you have to look at the hallmarks of a well-functioning team. There's the literature I like on it gets to psych, psychological or, or safety that the team feels with each other. Um, I think there needs to be good complementary with regard to the subject matter or the domains of expertise that are being brought to bear. Um, and then ultimately have they, have they found a way of working together where they exchange ideas, but ultimately don't get stuck and can still make a decision one, one way or the other. Super good insight. Um, I, I think there's another question, you know, while we're talking about this idea of teams, it kind of goes back to one of the slides you showed. Um, the question from Anonymous was, could you give us some insight into the structure of, of the teams doing the sort of analysis you laid out for the three-year plans that, that you showed for MoMA? So like, yeah, I guess who were, was it, were these being decisions coming from the top or were there you know, teams thinking of long-term versus short-term goals of, of MoMA? Yeah, I mean, by the time we um, by the time we closed the Series A financing, the team was already. Um, if you count, yeah, I mean, it's a difficult count because they were like in full time employees and they're consultants, and then there are people like me who work at Third Rock, but then still work for the company. But we're already twenty people at that point. Um, these are people with in depth experience on drug discovery, who are really making sure that we've sort of define timelines accurately and have, you know, reasonable projections or sort of forecast level projections on what's going to cost. Um, you know, we have folks who spend a lot of time in the capital markets and understand, you know, what the equity markets look like. No one really can predict the future, but we have a sense for where precedents are and where, you know, comparables are. Um, you know, we have people who have a lot of experience operating companies, um, certainly really strong biologic expertise. And all of that has to come together in what is essentially, an, an, you know, doesn't really do it justice to show it in a couple slides, uh, but there's a tremendous amount of work that underlies it and a tremendous amount of um, discussion that goes into it. Uh, so ultimately that, you know, one, one number has, you know, hours upon hours of thought and analysis that goes into it from all levels. We've been, we've been 
going deep into this topic of teams, and I think there's one interesting question that came up, um, and it's about the transition of the CEO role, or, or at least the founder. And as the as the company matures, you, sometimes there is a transition of roles. Um, can you speak to this? So this is the last question asked by Anonymous, uh, or actually not, I think the second to last, things are starting to shift right now. Going back to the founder team that has an academically or scientifically gifted CEO that can drive discovery into application. What is your take when there may be feedback to perhaps pass the torch to a different CEO and then the original CEO to become the CSO, Chief Scientific Officer, um, to help with scaling and commercializing uh, the platform or tech at, its, uh, at a different phase of its life cycle? Any thoughts here? Um, I mean, I think it's really hard to talk about that in, in a general sense, right? Um, I think one needs to, to just have very open and on to, honest discussions about what is in front of a company, what the challenges are ahead, and where where people have the experience and expertise to drive what piece of it. Um, all right, somebody who's spent their entire career in academia may or may not be the right person to commercialize a drug. Um, but I think that that kind of discussion needs to be had um, in, a, in a very sort of subject matter driven way and not necessarily be, oh, this person is academic, so we're going to move them over in a different seat. Like, that doesn't make sense. Absolutely. I think it goes back to your point about, you know, about how self-aware, right, the team is. Right. And understanding, you know, these are the strengths and weaknesses or maybe the gaps that we have right now. And this is how far we can really take it. And yeah. And also the safety it. to have the, the hard conversations. And that's not just necessarily the management team, but with board members and investors. And I'd say that's that's another important piece of this as we think about you know, wearing our entrepreneur hats, um, building alignment and, and really having buy in from a set of investors is incredibly important. Um, everybody really appreciating the challenges ahead and what it's going to take. Um, because we know this is going to be messy. Absolutely. We're starting to see a new theme pop up in the, in the questions, both in the chat and also in the Q and A starting to pivot more towards funding, um, especially around the series a. So one about how hard is it to receive series a funding, but I think other, there's one specific question about how uh, Momo was able to receive such a big series a, you know, any, you know, any insights there that you perhaps could share? I think if we look at some of the Series A financings lately, Momo was a relatively small round. Um, I'll try to give a less flip answer. I think, I think ultimately it came down to uh, a credible team, you know, well-matched to the task at hand, um, a description of the use of proceeds that also made sense for the the dollar amount, right? We weren't just raising $86 million to raise $86 million. I mean, for what we were really trying to solve, we needed that amount of capital. Now, was it 84? Was it 86? Was it 88? Yeah. I mean, we appreciate there's some error bars, but um, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't 40. Absolutely. Let's see. What other questions do we have along the theme? We do have some more specific questions. Um, about the company building, some more technical questions. Uh, Travis, is there anything, or Kevin, any specific questions or area themes that we want to dive into more specifically? Just the MoMA website is, it's, it's beautiful. And one, one thing that I noticed is that compared to like most other biotech company websites, like it really talked about a mission of wanting to make an impact and kind of, um, you, you could sense that there is a certain work culture at OMA. Was this something that was, I guess, conceptualizing from the very beginning, kind of just saying we are going to be mission oriented? And yeah, how do you how do you make sure how do you how do you propagate that culture as the company builds or as the company grows? Yeah, it's a good, really good question. Um, I think that, and this is this is maybe only related, but I promise to answer your question. I think there's a lot one can tell about a company in the way they talk about what they're doing. Some, some companies come out, and, and I'm not gonna say any of these are right necessarily, but I think it does ultimately lend to why we did it this way at MoMA. Um, is this company just trying to solve a problem? Is this company about this cool widget or this new technology? Is this company only about making money, right? Um, I, think, I think our intent was to really go out there and say, this is what we're about. 
And if that's something that gets you excited, come talk to us. You know, we look at the website as really a recruiting tool, um, but it's also meant to be definitional, definitional of the culture to the extent that if if that's not your cup of tea, no hard feelings, but this is what we're about. And if you align with that, come talk with us. Um, and that's ultimately the thought process and you know the time and you know there are, ex- there are external firms that help with this. I don't know how to code a website. Um, that that's ultimately the thought process that led led to it. It was really meant to be, um, you know, an, an embodiment or an, an ex, uh, used to really exemplify what our culture is, and then that should hopefully matriculate and help with the recruiting process.